My name is Dave Ripplinger, uh, Bioenergy Bioproducts Economic Specialist with NDCU Extension and the regular host of our monthly webinar. Uh, today, we're kind of covering the gamut, um, beginning with Brian Parman, who, because he does have some other commitments uh, immediately following his talk, if you have any questions for him, we'll actually uh, let, let you take those right away. Otherwise, if you have any questions, we'll save those towards the end uh, after everybody else has a chance to speak, uh, cover them then. Please use the Q&A function or the chat and we'll get to every question that you have. But with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. All right. Thanks, Dave. I'm going to pull up my screen share. Just give me a thumbs up if you when you see it. So today I'm going to talk about uh, backgrounding. Uh, it's that time of year uh, for our livestock producers to be, you know, they're going to start making decisions on are they going to background or sell weaned calves and what the outlook for that looks like uh, this year. So we're, we, we have a, a video series that, that covers this more in date, detail. And so I'm just going to kind of give a little bit of a Cliff's Notes version of, of that presentation if you want more information um, and, and how that sort of breaks out and our logic at coming to these conclusions, uh, you're free to, free to view those. Now, the first thing I want to say, though, uh, and this is kind of a, a myth or misconception sometimes that folks have when they're thinking about backgrounding, and that is that uh, during periods of high feed costs, uh, backgrounding won't make any money or it's harder to make money when feed prices are high. And that's not necessarily true and often isn't true uh, as long as the cattle market reacts accordingly um, to the way it typically does when that when that situation happens. So here's a here's a chart and this is this is older. It's from the year 2000. So corn prices are quite a little bit higher uh, now than they were then. But the relationship tends to hold. And that's what the uh, uh, what's important about it and important to remember. When you look at this, OK, we've got three separate corn prices, $1.68 per bushel corn. Uh, $2.60 corn, and then $3.50 corn, okay? And what you see is this is, and then on the bottom you have the weights of steers or, or, or uh, feeder calves, and then you have the uh, price uh, uh, difference here on the, on, the, on the left. And so when you take this corn price that's $1.68 a bushel, what you'll notice is the spread between 550 weight and eight weight steers or eight weight cattle um, is a lot bigger. Okay, so you feeder cattle are relatively more expensive compared to eight weight steers uh, when when corn is cheap or feed in general. This this would represent all feed. Uh, at two dollars and sixty cents, that line gets flatter, and then at three dollars and fifty two cents, that line's flatter still. So what winds up happening is relative to the price of eight hundred weight cattle, five hundred and fifty weight cattle are less expensive. So while you're you're paying more for feed you're rece receiving relatively more for your uh, fed, ca uh, uh, you know, backgrounded calves uh, because of the fact that in those scenarios, uh, cattle feeders are willing to pay you to put the weight on yourself. Okay, so those, those heavier weight cattle are relatively more valuable uh, relative to the 550 weights. And that's one of the ways that you wind up uh, still turning a profit even when, even when cattle feed prices are high. So here is uh, the, the assumptions that we use uh, for prices in the um, an analysis that we, that we put forth. And we use grass hay, alfalfa, silage, grain, DDGs, limestone. And we had to revise these up this year. The other revisions that we used that were higher uh, had to increase yardage costs. Now I'll say that Carrington uses 40, 40 cents in their analysis. Uh, typically, I raised it to 45 because we've had inflated costs, inflation in, in costs, that is, equipment costs, repair costs. So that has a, you know, and so I'm almost 10% increase there. Uh, had to increase the interest rate. Last year was a lot lower. Uh, it's about 7.5% now, 7 to 7.5%. 7 increased marketing costs, increased vet med costs, and then increased the trucking costs to a, a $1.50 per hundredweight. Shrink and death loss staying the same. So I just want to make clear that we've we have taken into account with these scenarios the increase in in costs. Now you might say, well, I don't charge yardage that high. Well, that's okay. Uh, I, I want to use a conservative number that uh, is high enough so that if I, if I am I, I'm not too low. In other words, I don't want to I don't want to project too much too much uh, uh, profit here. So we did six scenarios. Um, 
steers at three different rates of gain for the most part, one of which we take all the way out to finish. So 575 weight to 1270, and that one's putting on 3.6 pounds a day at $2.50 per, per uh, day. And then heifers, three different scenarios. We take really small heifers, 450 weight up to 750 at 1.8 pounds, then 550 to 850 also at 1.8, and then a more aggressive ration to gain 2.8 pounds per day. Uh, and that obviously that's gonna cost more to $1.74. So just to show you kind of what the what a ration would look like, here's a, a 1.8 pounds average daily gain expected uh, scenario for steers from 500 to 800 weight. And this is kind of, you know, we'd have 10 pounds of grass hay, 17 pounds of silage, two and a half pounds of DDGs, and then some salt comes out to $1.41. I'm not going to go through each one of these scenarios. I just want to show you. And then the higher rates of gain, when you start getting up to 2.8 or the 3.6 scenario, uh, that one is going to use a lot more corn um, than, than, than hay uh, to, to achieve that weight, and obviously a lot more in general. And so let's just talk about that quick uh, scenario I was said at first. The biggest thing with this, the takeaway from it is, so we go up here and we're, is on, uh, to get from 500 pounds to 800 pounds, it's 167 days on feed at 1.8 pounds per day. Here's the projected selling price and the, the beginning value of the, the 500 weight steer. And so what you see then is what's really, this winds up being a negative $2.26 total. Okay, so essentially break even uh, at best. And the biggest reason for that, these, this yardage cost, this lot cost at 45 cents a day, it comes out to $75.15. Uh, and that's where a lot of it's being eaten up because they're on feed for so long. So you're, you're paying these, these overhead costs for every day that it's uh, the animal sitting there in the lot. And as a result, you break even, it just eats into it. You're just not putting on the weight fast enough. It takes about as much work to, to feed a higher ration than a lower ration. And, and so the, the, the yardage cost eats into your potential profits. And then here's the, here's the example on 2.8 pounds on steers. Okay, and you can see more expensive, you're gonna be feeding some more corn, less less of uh, less hay we use some grass legume hay some silage more of that and, and ddgs for uh 35 pounds okay and that's obviously more expensive $1.76 but we're putting on 2.8 uh pounds a day and as a result what happens all of a sudden we're now turning a profit of 58 dollars per head or about 58 cents a day big reason the biggest reason for that yes the feed costs are a little bit higher but because they're only in the lot for 100 days instead of whatever it was before 167, let me double check. Yeah, 167, 167 days. So 100 versus 167, and our lot cost is only 45 bucks, right? And so that's where a lot of that is is coming from. Is we just and we don't have as much time uh, that the interest is eating into our our profits either because we're turning it turning them over faster. So I did these, these same kind of analysis that I just showed here. I did it for all the six scenarios you saw uh, previously. And I've got a table because in these presentations, we don't have time to go through these in so much detail. And so this was that first scenario I showed where essentially you're losing two cents a day, basically breaking even at best. The scenario I just showed, $58 per head. And then the finished steer, at 3.6 pounds a day, yeah, they're in the lot quite a while, but you're putting on a lot of weight, and that comes out to about 112 and a half per head. Uh, so you'd be making essentially 60 suit, 62 cents per head per day. Heifers was the same story. So I ran it for heifers. Doesn't matter if you start at 450, finish going to 750, or start at 550 to 850. The yardage fees just kill you at 170 days and 167 days, and you're just not, not putting the weight on. So essentially, you're 22 bucks and 17 bucks. It's pretty close to breaking even. But you get up to 2.8 pounds a day, and they're on feed for 90 days, and all of a sudden, we're making $100 a head now or almost a dollar a day. And so you've really got something there. So with the heifers, not only are you closing that spread gap, that's why it's the most profitable in terms of uh, uh, dollars per day per head. Uh, you're closing the spread gap and you're putting on the weight. So that's essentially what the, what, what it's telling us is that, uh, you know, 
we've got to put, uh, they are paying for us to put weight on. The relative value of 800 to 850 weight cattle is, is, is strong, even though, even though feeder, feeder cattle uh, prices are high. And if, but if we, is, if we keep them in the yard too long, uh, then that, then that yardage costs and the labor and everything else and the upkeep uh, erodes that profit. Uh, uh, for the most part, and so that's really what the, what it's telling us. Now, if you can put if you can put weight on at 1.8 pounds for a lot less than than what we're estimating, say, you know, we we say it's a dollar forty, and you can do it for 80 cents. Well, then that 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 obviously makes a difference. But you know, feed costs are what they are for the most part, and so if you're using your own materials, I mean, you got to charge yourself essentially market prices. So, concluding thoughts this year. More aggressive rations are much more profitable than, than the slow rate of gain due to higher yardage costs. This overhead cost has, has really increased quite a bit. And then the most profitable on a per day basis is backgrounding heifers at a high rate of gain because they're paying for weight to be put on, but also that price spread gap between heifers and steers where the slide happens. That tends to improve as you get to 800, 850 pounds. And by the time you get to finished weights, it's pretty much non-existent. Okay, so with that, I am finished with uh, my portion of the presentation today, and so I have a little bit of time um, to answer any questions that, that may, may come out here uh, in the chat. Brian, this is John. I wanted to ask you a quick question. Can you remind us what's in your yardage costs? Okay, so that's going to be things like electricity, uh, de you know, fuels, um, daily labor charges that kind of stuff thanks Th uh, i'll just say that things like trucking that's a separate cost you know for shipping animals in and out um vet fees those are out those are not in yardage now some some budgets you'll see they'll include feed in the yardage costs uh, i've seen budgets that do that we we do not we we separate uh the overhead from yardage and the, and the operating costs of like diesel fuel and everything goes into yardage and feed is a separate category. So that's just something to look at. If you see, if you see uh, uh, some of these other budgets I've seen where the yardage is 90 cents or, or $1.15 or something, that's because they're inclu including feed most of the time. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Frane Olson. I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist here with NDSU Extension. Um, I've got a, actually a portfolio of things that I want to talk about today. We'll start with an update on the USDA reports that came out yesterday, and we'll shift into some of the more, more current issues that I'm getting a lot of questions about. So let's start with um, the, the information from both the production report as well as the WASDE, the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates from yesterday's um, it release. Uh, I'd, I'd like to start with the production report. And again, so... Every every month during the growing season, USDA provides some updates on their expectation or forecasts for not only yields per acre, but they also might make some adjustments on plantings, but more importantly, the total production number. So if you take harvested acreage times yield, you should get total production. Um, so just to remind everybody about the layout of this particular table, um, what I'm trying to do is compare the the uh, what the industry estimates were or what the private forecasters, the private estimating firms were looking at before the report was released. And we'll compare that to what we saw last month and then obviously what we can what we got yesterday. So the blue row on the very top, which is average trade estimates. So there's a survey of about 20 to 25 private forecasting companies is made uh, usually about a week or so before the WASD and the production reports come out and say, well, what do you anticipate? What is your best estimate for what USDA is going to give us? Um, so if you look at the very top row, that is the average estimate for all of those that are reporting. We have the highest trade estimate, the lowest trade estimate to kind of give us the range of what that expectation might be. The highlighted black row um, towards the bottom is last month's information. And of course, the red highlighted in the very bottom uh, row is what we got yesterday. So typically what I do is I want to compare what was the trade expecting to see versus what did we actually get. And, and again, we can use last month as another reference point, but when it comes to market um, adjustments or any kind of market uh, uh, um, price movements, it's usually based upon what we expect to see, not necessarily what we had last month. 
So let's start with corn very quickly. I'd like to start with the yield number because there wasn't any adjustment in the harvested acreage estimates. It, this was all the, the, the change in production was all because of a change in the yield and yield forecasts. So there was a slight uptick in the national average yield in the United States. Um, that was really due to increased uh, yield projections out of both Illinois and Indiana. So it'd be the Eastern Corn Belt. Um, Illinois went from about 110 bushel statewide average to about 115 bushel statewide average. And Indiana went from about 187 to a 191. Um, uh, and so though the combination of those two relatively large corn producing states brought our average up a little bit. On the soybean side, again, we were expecting pretty much a flat line number um, based on what we saw last month. Oops, that, that 150.6 is a wrong number. I apologize. That's my error. I was going to correct that, and I, I didn't. Um, so what was the trade expecting to see? About a, just under 150, you got something just over 150. Very small change again. Not enough to really change market psychology a lot, little bit uh, much. We did get a slight increase in the production numbers. Most of the increase in the yields were really in those soybean producing regions kind of in the south and then the east of the of the what we would consider the corn belt so if we think about the mississippi river valley um those soybean the, the states along the mississippi river valley actually had a slight increase in their soybean yield expectations but more importantly it was basically the southeast uh portion of the midwest so think about for example kentucky missouri um, th those states, the, those the yields went up a little bit there enough to make a difference. So this is the production estimate. Now, when we look at ending stocks, and again, this is another key number that the market focuses on. We're taking not only total supply, but we're subtracting total usage to get a forecast or an estimate of how much do we think we're going to have in the grain system just before harvest of next year. So again, I want to compare the blue row on the very top with the red row on the very bottom. Um, the trade was expecting to see about uh, 578 million bushels of ending stocks in wheat. We got something very close, a little bit less than what the trade was anticipating. Uh, part of that was because USDA did a slight increase in the domestic food consumption. So basically the amount of, of wheat they're going to send into the milling sector. Um, again, not a large change, not enough to really shift market psychology or the expectations in a big picture sense, but we did some refinement. For corn, of course, we had a slight increase in the total corn production, but we actually had then, a, uh, relative to what the trade was expecting, um, there was an increase in, in ending stocks from last month, but the increase wasn't as large as what the trade was expecting. So translation is, yes, we had a slight increase in yield. Total production for corn went up, but USDA also adjusted the consumption side. So we uh, USDA increased feed consumption by about 25 million bushels. Again, part of that was because of an adjustment in the available supplies and a slight, a slight adjustment in yield and uh, excuse me in price expectations. For soybeans, uh, very similar to what the trade was expecting. Um, they were expecting a slight increase in ending stocks for soybeans. We did get that. We've been kind of on ending stocks for soybeans, kind of bouncing around between this uh, 200 million and about 220 million bushels back and forth. Once again, we said it had a slight increase in the production, but there was also a slight increase in the crushing numbers or the amount of soybeans going into the crush sector domestically that, that offset or compensated. So after talking for a long time, the moral of the story was, I think most people considered this to be a relatively neutral uh, reports, set of reports. Uh, no big shocks or surprises. Um, I did go through the global forecasts uh, for global production and consumption. Again, some very, very minor changes or tweaks and adjustments. So really, this is a status quo report. There wasn't a lot of shock value to it. So these, what I consider to be things that are inside of agriculture that we need to be watching. Now I wanna turn attention to some things outside of agriculture that are also impacting uh, uh, markets as well, both cash markets as well as futures markets. So the first one, um, in, and I did write about this in our, in our most recent uh, Ag by the Numbers newsletter. Um, I, I, I go through some, uh, a bit more of the details there if you are interested. So this is a map based on um, the November 8th uh, um, drought monitor map. And what they've done here, 
which is kind of slick is they've been they've identified what is the essentially the the watershed area for the Mississippi River. So just to orient to everybody, down here is New Orleans in the very south. Um, this is obviously North Dakota. We get into Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. So this would be the the Ohio River. This would be the Missouri River. Um, this would be the Arkansas River. So these are the major rivers, tributaries that go into the Mississippi River. And it, as you as you probably recognize the or have heard, there's been a lot of challenges with the, the amount of barge traffic, in particular for grain and fertilizer, moving up and down the lower Mississippi. So when we talk about the lower Mississippi, we typically we're looking at something from St. Louis South is kind of the common definition. So this lower Mississippi River levels are, are is, is actually relatively unusual. A lot of times we'll have some, some barge problems or some river level problems, maybe on the Ohio River or the Illinois River. Um, or even ports, portions of the Missouri River. But it's, it's kind of unusual for that southern part of the Mississippi to have these kinds of problems. So I just wanted to give you an idea. This is the Mississippi River uh, watershed. You can see based on the drought monitor map that yes, there's a lot of dry soil conditions. The reason that becomes important is that we are having a hurricane that has been striking now um, that Florida. And, and with that, there's going to be a pretty significant amount of rainfall that's going to have some wraparound and hit the eastern corn belt, or basically the, this eastern region right here. And the big question I think people are asking is, so will that, will that help mitigate or reduce some of the problems we're seeing? And I guess the challenge I think we're facing is even though um, Ohio and into Pennsylvania and Kentucky are going to get some more rain and rain showers over the next several days, you know, it's it's forecast to be about three to four inches of rainfall. The question I have is, again, given that the very dry soil moisture conditions, they have very warm weather. It's been in the 70s, uh, mid to upper 70s in this rate range right now or in this region. How much of that water, that rainfall that does come will actually be able to hit some of the tributaries, go into the Ohio River and finally into the Mississippi. So even though it's going to be helpful, and I think we need to be watching this, I guess the long-term outlook, and I think the expectation from the marketplace is that we're gonna to continue to have some level of problems with barge shipping for the next several months at least. Again, a lot of that will depend upon rainfall and snowfall within this watershed. So I just wanted to give you a visualization and thinking just because it's raining doesn't mean that that water is gonna end up in the river system. So let's look a little bit at barge freight rates. So each of those bars is a weekly freight rate. This is updated as of this morning. Um, the the blue blue line that runs kind of through the middle is the three year average for barge rates going from the Illinois River down to the Gulf of Mexico, and you'll notice this last week we did get a retracement or at least a lowering of some of those barge freight rates. So to, to make a comparison, I did the math really quick because this is based off of an index. If we look at the rates that were charged last week, that was about uh, uh, one thousand nine hundred and twenty five. Uh, uh, on an index, which when you translate into, you know, 60 pound bushels, like for soybeans or wheat, that's about $2.68 per bushel for freight costs. By dropping it from last, last week's rate to this week's rate, we went from 168 or 268, excuse me, down to 169 or about a dollar per bushel drop in the cost of moving grain, particularly soybeans in this example, from that Illinois River where, where it enters the Mississippi down to the Gulf. Now, that's a significant drop. It's obviously improving our ability and the cost to be able to deliver to the Gulf ports. But recognize the long-term average right here is about 139 on that, on that index, which is about 19 cents. So call it 20 cents a bushel versus this current rate, which is lower at about $1.69. So freight rates, barge freight rates on the Mississippi River are still very, very highly elevated. They are going to have a limitation or, or create some challenges, I think, from a cost standpoint for the Mississippi Gulf uh, to be competitive in the global market. So again, we need to watch this very, very closely. Um, this is uh, from the what's called Lock 27, which is at Granite City, Illinois. So this is one of those, again, key locks where we start monitoring how many bushels of what kinds of grain is flowing through this particular lock as, as the Illinois River enters into the Mississippi River. 
the, the reason I wanted to show this is it's look at the type of products that are being shipped. So if you look on the far right hand side at this is stack bar graph, the yellow is soybean and the blue is corn. And you can't really see it. It's, it's wedged in between there. That's wheat. So the majority of the grain moving from the Illinois uh, river system into the Mississippi River system has been over the last several weeks, primarily soybeans. And again, soybeans moving into the Gulf ports to be loaded onto ocean vessels. What we're seeing now as the freight rates, the barge freight rates start to drop, we're seeing a little bit of a resurgence or an increase in the amount of corn that's being shipped. So the priority up until, even though the costs have been very high, there's been some challenges moving product. The priority has been to try and ship soybeans into the Gulf of Mexico and, and to a lesser degree to ship corn. This is having some impact on uh, rail freight, on secondary rail markets. Again, this was updated as of today. Um, now, I want you to, to, to explain this very quickly. The solid line is the secondary rail market or the cost for renting additional uh, trains. So you have a base rate that, that, that's paid, and then you have to pay a premium if you want to sublease those trains from someone else. So the base rate is set between a particular shipper and the, the, the railroad company, like in this case, I'm using BNSF as the example. Um, so the, the primary market is when I, as a shipper, contract for long-term contract, usually about a uh, one-year lease with BNSF. I have the choice then to either use it myself or sublease it to someone else. But I can sublease that either at a premium or a discount. So if we look at for shipping in December, the dotted line is where the rates are typically at this time of year. That's a three-year average. So about a $200 per car premium for, for typical um, rail freight at this time. Well, last week, we were at um, $1,188 for a BNSF shuttle, and it's now dropped to $850 per car premium. So when you translate that, if we go back to last week's number, that's about a 32 cent per bushel premium that has to be paid just for additional freight to be able to ship. That additional freight rate is now dropped to about 23 cents per bushel. So there's still an extra cost to try and use, use rail freight over what we would normally see this time of year, but it is starting to mitigate or reduce a little bit because that barge traffic is starting to pick up. So translation is the pressure on the rail system. It's still there. There's still gonna be a lot of pressure to try and deliver grain either to the PNW ports as an alternative to the Gulf of Mexico or using rail rather than barge to ship into those Gulf port facilities. So. We are starting to see, even though we saw this rapid spike and increase in transportation costs internally, we're starting to see some of that back off a little bit as we start to work through the backlog and some of the challenges. And obviously, as harvest now starts to wrap up, the volume of grain that's flowing from the country into those export terminals will likely slow just because there is this heavy rush and, 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 and need for uh, exports during that harvest delivery period. Um, another way to monitor this is how much grain has been inspected at different ports. And I just wanted to show, so the red bar on top, the solid red is the amount of inspections by week in the Mississippi Gulf. So this would be the, the Louisiana ports. And the dotted red line represents the three-year average. So over, over this, this problem that we've had with shipping, the volume of grain that's being shipped and, and shipped into the Gulf ports and inspected before it loaded onto a vessel um, was behind normal. So we saw this normal curve during the harvest period. Some of that was delayed because of our shipping problems. There were some catch up that was done. We're starting to see those drop off again. Now, as a result, though, look what happened at the Pacific Northwest, which is the blue. So this is what happened, the solid line over the last several weeks. The dotted line is what we saw over the three-year average. So notice out of PNW, we saw a real big surge and an increase above, well above normal inspections, meaning shipments into the PNW ports to be able to load it on the vessels. So the translation is, I do think some of the vessels that were intended to be loaded in the Gulf 
were rerouted into the PNW and filled out of PNW uh, supplies rather than the, P the uh, Gulf supplies, which again, a lot of that PNW supply chain comes from North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Western Minnesota. So one of the reasons, even though freight rates have gone up, secondary rail markets have gone up, we really haven't seen much of a change in our local basis levels is because there is this demand coming out of the PNW. So rephrasing that a little differently, what that really means is the increased freight rates right now are being passed along to the end user. So it's either the, the, the end user consumer or it's the people that have booked this freight. It's the local elevator or the, the export terminals that are absorbing this extra cost. Some of that they're absorbing, some of it they're going to try and pass on to the end user. So I just want to re, you know, reiterate that there's a lot of times farmers think, well, just because rail freight goes up or transportation goes, got, goes up, that all of a sudden we're paying the entire amount of that bill. And that's really not true. The bill for transportation is always shared between the buyer and seller. And so I just wanted to demonstrate, here's an example, a real world, real time example of what's happening. Shifting gears, I do want to talk a little bit about Ukraine-Russia shipping agreement. Um, it's come under the spotlight over the last couple of weeks. I think we're going to continue to hear a lot of news about the developments and how this is all working out. So just to give a real quick recap, um, last July, there was an agreement signed between uh, Turkey and Ukraine and a second agreement between Turkey and Russia. So there's actually two different agreements. They were helped. The negotiation was, was kind of spearheaded by the United Nations. So they had an agreement to allow safe passage for grain out of both the Russian ports as well as the Ukrainian ports to try and improve the flow of grain in particular into some of those wheat and corn markets that are very dependent upon those supplies that can't afford to really go into the global market and buy a large quantities of wheat off the market. So this agreement was signed, but the, the agreement was only valid for 120 days. Basically, this was a trial period. That 120 days now will end on November 19th. So there's a timeline that this has to be renewed or, or, or at least uh, renegotiated. And that negotiation has been going on. Now, if you remember right, ab about a week ago, Russia suspended this agreement for about four days because of a drone attack. So there was a, a, an attack on a Russian naval base in Crimea, which is that peninsula that kind of divides where the, the Russian ports are versus where the uh, um, Ukrainian ports are. Now, there was that was a, a a suspension for about four days. Now, when that happened, wheat prices popped. We had about a 40, 45 cent increase in wheat just because of this suspension. And then, of course, once that suspension was rescinded and said, okay, we're going to allow shipments, we figured out how to make this agreement continue to work. All of a sudden, wheat prices dropped again pretty rapidly. So where do we stand today? Shipments are going through um, based on the old agreement. However, the United Nations and Turkey are currently negotiating with both Russia and Ukraine to both expand and extend this agreement. Now, the Russians have some de are really demanding some concessions on the economic sanctions that Western nations have imposed. And in particular, they're trying to get a relaxation of some of the banking restrictions to help finance both grain and fertilizer sales or shipments. So again, whenever you're talking international trade, you, you have to worry about the financing of this trade agreement, right? Of this contract for purchase and sale. And normally in the old days before the war, a lot of those transactions were handled by uh, European or American banks. Well, with the banking restrictions because of the war, the Russians are having a very difficult time getting financing to be able to sell and deliver both grain and fertilizers. So they're putting pressure on the system, trying to say, we need to have some relaxation of these restrictions. The Ukrainians really want to expand this to include a 12-month agreement, so we don't have to have a whole bunch of these little short negotiations, but they also want to include more port facilities, because right now, the current agreement only covers three ports. The largest of those is Odessa, and then there's two smaller ports right next to Odessa. So really, it's just a, a small cluster of ports that are allowed to be able to have this safe passage. And what Ukraine wants to be is to be able to expand that safe passage corridor to include more port facilities. So again, these are the issues. You're going to hear, be hearing a lot more about it. 
It does have some shock value in the marketplace, obviously, because of the example of when Russia suspended the agreement. So wheat is going to be the most sensitive. Corn will have some response to it, but not to the degree that wheat will. And my last uh, slide, the last set of comments, this is something that we have been talking about for actually for about 12 months now, but it's really not hit the top of the news cycle. And I do want to bring this up because it has some potential long-term implications. So Mexico, just as a reminder, is the largest export destination for U.S. corn. So Mexico is the largest buyer of corn, except for last year when it was China. But with that exception, Mexico has been our number one buyer of U.S. corn for many years. Well, their new president issued, after he took, after he took office, issued a decree, basically an executive order, that Mexico would ban the use and importation of genetically modified corn or all crops by 2024. And they'd also start to phase out the use of glyphosate domestically. Now, yesterday, Mexico's government, the government organizations, the government agencies said that they cannot purchase any uh, U.S. yellow corn that um, because it uh, it does because they don't want the GM corn. So the vast majority, 96%, I believe, of the, of the U.S. corn has GM traits to it. Well, if you're going to import generic U.S. number two corn, number two yellow corn, it's likely going to have some GM traits to it. Now, this is the Mexican government. So the government does make purchases off the, off the market. It, right now, to my knowledge, to my understanding, there's not a restriction on private companies buying U.S. corn, but there is some restrictions on government agencies buying U.S. corn. And when we look at total exports into Mexico, it's always a blend of what the government is doing versus what private companies are doing. So what I'm saying is this is starting to signal now that the, the Mexican government, the current administration, is very serious about this. So now as an alternative, what Mexico is trying to do is they're trying to, to move to a system where they direct contract or have direct agreements with farmers to purchase non-GMO corn. So they want to go kind of a contracting system directly with farmers rather than going through the open market. And then finally, just as a reminder, so Mexico is pretty much self-sufficient in white corn, which is the primary use for food like tortillas, et cetera. They do import a lot of yellow corn, large quantities, a lot of it, most of it from the United States, primarily for livestock feed. But there are some food uses for yellow corn in Mexico. And of course, that's what's causing the problems. My last comment, and then I'll hand it over to, to Tim Petrie, is that, yes, we do have this US, USMCA, US-Mexico-Canada agreement. There are some specific provisions in that regarding trade for GM and non-GM and products. And obviously this is going to go on for a while. So we'll have to wait to see, will, will the U.S. Uh, negotiators be able to use the USMCA as enough leverage to prevent any kind of restrictions on U.S. corn entering the Mexican market? So just keep your eyes and ears open. This is something else that we're going to have to be paying attention to. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I will hand things over to Tim. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Uh, today, I'm going to just expand on some of the things that Brian said. We did not compare, compare notes before this, but uh, many of the things I'm going to say just kind of uh, uh, mirror what he had to say. Uh, he did mention that we're going to provide more information, and that is now available. Uh, and uh, the website is a long one. I would have given you the URL, but uh, my fingers have been crushed in too many uh, uh, squeeze shoot gates. And I, if I tried to type it, I wouldn't get it. It's a whole page across. So if you just Google NDSU extension, Ag Hub, you see in the red circle there, and then backgrounding, you'll get to the backgrounding web site. And uh, at the present time, we have three new videos on there. Uh, Dr. Jerry Stucka has got, they're all about 20 minutes long. So I'm only going to talk to you about 10 minutes as Brian did. So all of ours, if you want to know more about either what Brian said or I said, or, or about what Dr. Stucka says, just uh, log, just do that. 
uh, extension ag hub backgrounding and you'll get to it. And, uh, and, and then you click on like the ones below. One more is going to be added. Dr. Carl Hoppe at the Carrington Research Station is gonna do one on alternative feeds and feed costs. Brian, again, alluded to the fact that we can feed different things and that feed might be high. And so uh, uh, Carl is gonna to talk to you about that. So those are all important issues and help yourself to that. So, um, these are my charts that I keep for 550 to six weight steers on the top. And then for the seven to eight weights on the bottom that are important in, in backgrounding because on the top, either you're pricing your own cattle into your backgrounding lot or you're buying them or the other thing is, should I sell them? So I'm gonna to get to the market report in a minute that Brian mentioned before and, and, and do some things. But yeah, our calf prices are th have been averaging $30 uh, more than last year and uh, you know are right now up there and probably you know we've kind of put in our seasonal below this week in North Dakota is going to be a tougher price wise for uh, calves because um, yesterday at KISS the market was off a little bit because of the storm Napoleon is closed today the Napoleon market they hope to have a sale tomorrow and uh, Stockman's are closed today uh, they had a sale Tuesday but they're not going to have a sale today and and so that might affect the prices a little bit. But anyway, like Brian said, just because prices are higher doesn't mean we can, uh, can't background. And so we have to look at the uh, price of steers going out and corn. And so go down to the bottom slide there uh, is the heavier weight yearlings. And again, they're about $20 higher than they were last year. But what's Im I think important for us, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more is uh, what are our expectations for prices. And so the red line is cash prices, but those gold squares, then there is a futures market for 800 pound steers. And so, uh, you know, there, th those are what you could lock in if you do a futures contract, or I'm just gonna mention livestock risk protection here in a minute. The market just closed and uh, the January futures closed at 181.70, up about $2 today. And that's what I've got on the chart there. March at 183.80 and uh, April up at 186.95. So, uh, you know, I think he used 184 in his budgets. And so, you know, depending on when you sell them, that, that might be the case there. So, Here's the, on the left is the market report that Brian showed you, but again, I wanna expand on that and, and uh, use this market report as uh, some stuff, some uh, information maybe that you can backgrounding. So in the middle, that purple circle there, you know, that's basically what he was using, or if he went down to the, to the and there's one budget down to the 500 pounders, he used 214 and so on. But uh, let's just use this 550 to six weight steers. And yeah, the average was about 207 uh, last week. That's what I have in my chart. But look at there at the wide range in prices for the same weight and grade of cattle at the same markets there, 187 up to 227. So from a backgrounding standpoint, you start getting up there into that 225, 227 uh, steers, uh, you know, back to his budget, you're going to uh, need to have a really good price coming out or really cheap corn. So, you know, what I'm saying is if some, maybe some of those top end steers you have that are going to bring that price uh, $1,300 ahead, uh, maybe we could sell some of those and, and take the money. And, and uh, again, it all depends on whether you know, you're pricing them in or, or whatever. If you're buying cattle to background, you can go back down to, uh, you know, under the 207 average and, you know, maybe at 190 up to 200 or whatever and, and add value to those calves. And so uh, keep in mind that, that wide range there. The other thing that I wanna mention is you see those fleshy categories, they were on his as well. And, uh, and he used 640 for corn. Corn is high priced. And so I know we love to feed our cattle and I know we like to see them gain weight, but be careful in your backgrounding program not to get them too fleshy because you're gonna spend more money on feed and get a lower price at the market, which just does not make sense. So you just 
just kind of be careful there. Uh, again, he used 640. I just pulled an ethanol plant there at, towards the top of the chart today. Uh, ethanol plant in North Dakota, it was paying 596. So maybe, you know, since his budgets, corn would be down a little bit and, you know, offer some more profit levels there. But on the other hand, there's another uh, ethanol plant that I looked at is at 644, which is more than he had in there. So corn prices are very throughout North Dakota and the basis levels are different and so on. So uh, depending on what you are, again, it's important to use uh, a budget. Uh, on, if you just Google livestock economics, uh, it, there's tools there and the, the budget that he showed you and, and that I use is there. And so you can put your own numbers into that budget. Uh, the, the main one that I've, we, we got on there is the 550 uh, up to the uh, 800 pound, but you can put your own numbers in that and, and play around with that with your own feed cost and so on. The other thing that he mentioned was heifers, and I was, you know, I was going to expand on that, and I, I didn't know how much he was going to cover there. But just like he said, you know, let's go up to those 475 pound heifers, 450 to uh, to uh, 500 pounds. You see, the steers last week averaged about 224, but go over there the heifers 193, 194. So you got that big you know, $30 discount for heifers. And we do background a lot of heifers in North Dakota and keep them for replacements. In fact, uh, I'll mention more of that in the next slide. But on January 1st, we had the eighth largest number of replacement heifers ever after the worst drought and, you know, since the drought monitor started in, in 2000 at least. And yet we still had the eighth number largest number of replacement heifers and six out of the last 10 years, we've had the top 10 amount of replacement heifers ever going back to 1920. So why do we keep heifers? One, it's because they're so severely discounted now compared to their steer counterparts. Like Brian said, every 50 pounds they gain, they gain on steers till slaughter steers and heifers. Well, actually slaughter heifers sold for a little more than slaughter steers last week because of the cuts are smaller. But then let's drop down, like he said, drop down to those uh, seven, close to 800, 750 to 800 pound steers. We're at 174 and the heifers at 170. So there's only a $4 discount. So like why his best budget was for heifers, the best profitability was that you're you're uh, gaining on steers in terms of, of a price rate there. So I would encourage, you know, we do background a lot of heifers and I'm sure that th those listeners that do that are thinking about it again. And that is a good value added enterprise for our heifers. And we do that, do do that in North Dakota. And uh, the, th these are uh, North Dakota farm business management records. And Brian actually does these. And so, Kind of for interest sake, I just went back and looked at the last 12 years of uh, profits from of developing replacement heifers versus beef backgrounding. And uh, you see an average there for developing a replacement heifers. Now you realize it's a longer, you keep them a longer time. You know, we, we put them in the lot now and take them to spring and then over the summer breed them and then sell them uh, next fall is when we price them out for that North Dakota farm business management. And I realize it's also skewed by the really, really high one in 2014, but it still averages uh, with throw 2014 out, it still averages about $200 there compared to an average on uh, backgrounding of $41. Again, he showed you on those 550 weight steers up to eight, uh, uh, about a $58 on his average. So that uh, fits right in there. Last year was better than that, you see, and, I'm, and, and uh, it's all, like he said, it's all about pricing them in and pricing them out. Why did we have a good year last year in backgrounding? Well, let's go back up to our prices there. So we go up to our 550 pound steers. And again, it depends on when you price them in, but if you price them in in October there, 
Uh, they were about 165. That light blue line is last year, about 165. So then we go and bring them out on the bottom chart down there, the 750 to 8 weights there in January, February, they were 165. So there wasn't even a slide by the time we got there last year we were selling them for the same or in february there they're they're bringing 170 so you're gaining on the weight that you even put in that's why it was such a good backgrounding year and we don't know what's going to happen this year and so on but uh, you know right now he's in the in the in a little bit uh, over what the average is but maybe a little bit under last year with his 58 dollars but again I mean, corn might be cheaper than he had in his budget and you have your own numbers to compare there. So, uh, you know, the, the, the cattle cycle, price cycle is going up. We've got better prices. You see the futures market here is better next year and will likely be better the next year and calf prices will be higher. And that's what it looks like. But when you're backgrounding, you know, it's a seasonal thing. And if you sell them all the middle of February or the 1st of March or whatever it might be, you're at the mercy of that uh, day. And we've seen it happen in the past, uh, uh, the COVID year 2020, selling background cattle were bad. The later we went because the market was plunging there. So, you know, uh, Frain has mentioned a bunch of issues going on and, you know, the, with the we have the economy, the weather conditions, what are corn prices going to do, all the geo political thing from, you know, the Russia, Ukraine, but North Korea is shooting missiles into the sea and we've got a new Brazilian president and Frain mentioned the Mexican president and all those issues uh, do cause volatility and risk and, and so, especially on a seasonal basis. So I don't think just because it looks like prices are higher that we should uh, throw uh, uh, you know, price risk management out the window. I still think it's something that we should look at and talk to your lender and depend on your risk exposure. Again, there on the left-hand side, there are a number of different risk management tools that, that are available in, for livestock. And, uh, and, and if you're familiar with one and use one and one is better than the other, and again, talk, talk to your lender, but uh, you know, maybe consider that. I'm just going to show you, uh, you know, uh, one on livestock risk protection here, just to kind of finish up as a, as an example. But uh, this was yesterday's livestock risk protection highest coverage available, and uh, and so uh, the, the nice thing about LRP it offers flexibility because the futures market futures and options are only for 800 pound steers. But in LRP, you can do steers or heifers, and then you say what they will weigh, and that's the premium you pay. And the real advantage is you can do any number. You can do one head if you want to. But anyway, you may, if you're looking at price risk management, want to do a few, you could do four, you know, five, 15, 20 head or whatever, and some steers and heifers and wait and see what the market does. And if it looks like we're running into trouble, do some more or whatever. But anyway, going across the top, yesterday could have, done a 178.65, you know, our cost is about $3. And uh, this is going to be higher today. On the bottom, I had, uh, 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 you know, the, the futures earlier, we had to get this done by 11 to send it in. But January futures closed today at uh, just a little bit higher than what's shown there, 181.70 in the March at 183, you know, just like it like shows there. So these offerings that come out this afternoon at 3.30, the prices are going to be, since the futures were up a couple dollars today, uh, the price offering is likely to be also be up a couple dollars today and, and uh, for a, probably a similar uh, cost premium to, to you. And then the heifers are, uh, the offering and so on are just always discounted 10% from the steer. So I'm not saying, you know, you have to do this and I'm not saying don't look at futures and options or other methods. I'm just uh, you know, giving you a, a, a little scenario here. And I realize a lot of you, maybe you don't know about LRP or other. And if you do want more information on it, you can see your extension agent about uh, programming. And I'm happy to provide education uh, if you want that. But my main idea is to tell you here is, you know, we're if we're selling them all our backgrounded cattle at one point in time this spring, you know, the market could 
be affected at that time. So uh, just don't forget about price risk management. Just another thing, probably switching from the producer side to the more the consumer side, we've seen all this news media lately about where, uh, you know, I, I, I agree that even influenza has caused a lot of turkey loss and that uh, prices are higher, but uh, that the, the idea that there are, or won't be turkeys available is not really the case. And uh, if you read our news, newsletter, I had to, quite a bit more on that, but uh, you know, high prices try to cure the situation. And so uh, actually the US is the largest turkey producer in the world and the largest exporter of turkey in the world. But since uh, we did lose turkeys and price went up, this year, go to the right hand, we are importing a whole bunch more turkeys and on the bottom exporting less turkeys because uh, uh, we have fewer here. And down on the bottom left, we put uh, hen turkeys into the cold storage kind of throughout the year uh, to, to get them to Thanksgiving time and then take them out. The Tom's more go into processing for the drumsticks and turkey bacon and all those things. But interestingly enough, it doesn't show up quite as well on this slide, but we had, uh, you know, our last cold storage report showed 3% more hen turkeys in cold storage than last year. And if you remember last year, kind of maybe there was that same rumor, but there were turkeys around. And yeah, prices are higher. But on the other hand, usually when we get near to Thanksgiving, the week or so before here coming up, uh, stores lost leader turkeys at lower than their cost simply to lure you in to buy all the other ingredients for the holiday meal, the green beans and the dressing and all that. And so, you know, wars develop and that's kind of probably uh, likely to happen again. So, and the other thing is we have record meat production. And so we have uh, actually plenty of other meat alternatives as well. And so uh, with that, uh, Veterans Day is coming up tomorrow. Both Brian and I are veterans. And so uh, on behalf of Brian and I, we uh, wish all our fellow veterans and servicemen a happy Veterans Day. And with that, we will go to Dave. Great. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I would uh, caution any new parents to reconsider serving something other than turkey. I actually did that a few years ago. And I think my then six-year-old's jaw dropped. It was a beautiful country ham, um, but that kind of exploded in my face. Um, anyways, uh, today I'm going to talk about something that's actually been a long time in coming. Uh, we're entering the last few months of 2022, which is the last year of having statutory numbers for the RFS. Um, so I just wanted to go through this because we're actually going to enter this new period where EPA is going to determine what those numbers are going to be. So just a reminder, the RFS has been critically important to agriculture, especially in its early years in helping support the build out of the corn ethanol and biodiesel industries, which led to, you know, a, a significant increase in demand for corn and soybean, uh, soybeans here in the United States. A little quick review. So it was enacted in 2005 and updated in 2007, expanded. The way it works, uh, which it was kind of important as we move forward. You know, there's certain businesses called uh, obligated parties that are required to participate in the program, and they either have to physically uh, handle biofuel or trade for credits for somebody who does. And so each year, they have to turn in RINs to the EPA that kind of document what they did uh, in terms of actual physical activity or their trade. Uh, important in that is that each year... EPA, supposed to be in the summertime, is announces that number for the next year. It's the Renewable Volume Obligation, or RVO. The total number that EPA is requiring across the economy to be used in, in, in that next year. Um, you know, the EPA is the regulator. Uh, they had some flexibility in its management, both in terms of, of what the law said, and then as they created their own regulations to manage it. Uh, and it's, it's been a bit of a bumpy ride uh, with really uh, inconsistent application of, of policy and rules and following timelines and the like under, you know, the, the current and, and, and previous two administrations, basically the entire life of the RFS. It's, you know, it's experienced uh, some, some unique 
unique attributes based on how EPA administered administered the program. Um, important to note too is that again they can adjust these RVOs uh, based officially on two things: uh, either inadequate supply, which is not demand. So would the would folks be able to bring this to market? Was it physically available? Uh, in the market or would be in that next year, or would it cause severe economic or environmental impacts to communities or, or industries? Important to note too, they've never, they never really used this, this widespread number on economic impact, including in the drought in 2012. That has never been the reason, but they've certainly gone in uh, year after year and, 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 and ratcheted down the number. So this is a chart that shows that at least through through 2019 and, and what they did. So there's the statutory volumes on the left. So that's what Congress said when they passed the, the second bill in 2007, they actually had the standards and said, this is what we expect it to be. But again, EPA could adjust those numbers and ended up adjusting them quite dramatically. Uh, one of the first things they did is they've never really increased that cellulosic biofuel number because there really hasn't been much available on the market. Uh, and they've really kind of capped the conventional biofuel uh, mandate, that number. And again, note it doesn't say corn ethanol, but they've really capped that number at 10% of the amount of gasoline sold. So it kind of pretending that there's this, this, this blend wall or having a regulatory based blend wall. Uh, and that's, you know, that's persisted for, you know, almost a decade in, 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 in light of th those different options they had and through a variety of different uh, sets of conditions, both political and, and market-based. But again, the, the big thing to take from this is that the EPA has uh, asserted its authority and changed those statutory volumes quite a bit. But what's important is those, those statutory levels only went through this year. So now it's really interesting. We were actually officially supposed to have draft guidelines on this coming Monday of what EPA plan to do, not just what it's going to set for the next year or a few years, but actually what how they're going to manage the program, how they're going to set those numbers, what philosophy they're going to use. And it is really important because it will let us know if the EPA is going to actually have any teeth in, in managing the program. Uh, and qu that question is, is really kind of up in the air. They were supposed to do it. It's supposed to come out on Monday. I just saw that they're going to wait two more weeks before well, they've asked for two more weeks uh, to finalize the rule, but not not change the, the the date of the final rule. So again, they're going to issue these draft guidelines. Folks can make comments. EPA takes them back and issues a final rule. The date of the final rule is still June of next year. Uh, and there's a you know a lot of questions about you know what exactly is this going to look like and and how much is it really going to mean, knowing that the RFS has been managed uh, and some decisions have been made under varying conditions or with varying justifications for for quite some time. Uh, just moving over really quick, talking about what's going on in the ethanol market, because it is interesting. Uh, you know, we had this dramatic decline in ethanol production in the late summer, and then an equally impressive uh, uh, recovery or, you know, just uh, increase in production back to the previous levels. You know, a lot of this was driven by uh, just some simple, you know, market economics. You had old crop, kind of expensive. Folks needed to, you know, the refineries do need to have maintenance. A number of them went offline, did their maintenance uh, in, in, in August, September, uh, getting ready for that new crop to come online and have done so. I also have on this chart so that the, the production is that blue line. So you can see that significant drop and then recovery uh, uh, on the chart. And then you also see, too, that stocks are actually, you know, pretty, pretty well declining during that during that time. You know, the, 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 there wasn't oversupply. It wasn't as if, you know, the. They were responding to that type of issue. It was really just getting ahead of this 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 next thing. This is actually a little bit different than what happened in gasoline. Uh, these numbers are for gasoline that's supplied. So this is gasoline going from the wholesaler up that supply chain. So you can kind of think about those gasoline sales. So that's that blue number. You know, if you if you look at it, you know the number throughout the summer was kind of choppy, uh, and then a little bit a little bit lower in that that late summer period and right at that late summer period is when the, the ethanol production fell off a cliff um and, and at that same time gasoline supplies actually came online they kind of refilled refilled everything as, as they they needed to manage their physicals on, on the right hand side and what that red line is is production 
relative to gasoline supplied. So I take this as kind of a proxy for a blend rate. So we, you know, long heard, you know, that there, there's an E10 uh, blend wall. And in some cases, there, there is a regulatory blend wall based on uh, read vapor pressure and emissions. Uh, also, just this idea that, you know, you couldn't go beyond that because, you know, no one would put in flex fuel pumps. No one had flex fuel vehicles, even though there were folks ready to do that. And what we've seen, in, you know, really since the recovery from COVID is we've seen use far above that 10% level, uh, partially because of E15. And again, there's an E15 waiver right now uh, because of uh, high energy prices. It's an emergency declared by the administration. Uh, E15 widely available, as well as some pickup in E85 sales in, in certain markets, including California, because they're low carbon uh, fuel standard. But it is interesting, too, you know, that it's that it's been at that level. Of course, it dipped. Gasoline supply didn't dip at that period, but now it's recovered. Just kind of a, a unique, a unique late summer that we've kind of been through. And, and we'll see what happens for the transportation fuel industry as we, we enter winter. You know, things should slow as the economy, you know, enters recession, possibly if it hasn't already you know, what that'll mean to, to, to gasoline sales, to biofuel sales. So those were the comments that I had. Um, now we're happy to turn it over for Q&A. Um, and I do see that we do have one question, but as we feel these questions, you're more than welcome to ask additional questions uh, as, as time goes on. And Frank, it looks like this one is for you. Um, and, it, and it's a good one. And so it, I'll, I'll read it aloud, but you might want to read it twice. Uh, so... Soybeans traditionally had been uh, 80, 80 cents to $1.10 under for my basis, so a negative basis. This harvest, they were negative 35 to negative 40. Is that due to the shifting of exports to the PMW? If so, are the buyers not worried about the lower protein content, which tr was traditionally an issue? So a great question. Okay, and so the, the person to answer it. <laughs> well, I, I hope so. Um, and I don't know if if John had a had some, some comments to make too or not. We'll... I'll answer this question and then um, we'll we'll find out if John has comments as well. Um, so very quickly, uh, all things being equal, there is a slight discount for soybeans in the marketplace, global marketplace for soybeans shipped through the PNW. Um, we tend to have lower crude protein levels. So when you measure it with the standard NIR uh, machine like they have in the driveway of the elevator, um, the crude protein levels in the soybeans in the northern growing regions tend to come out lower. However, when you measure the amount of uh, amino acid content, basically the when you, when you crush it and turn it into soybean meal and you look at the quality and the feed value of the soybean meal, that amino acid content is actually higher or more favorable for, in particular, for pork feed, um, you know, for uh, hog feed um, than other parts. And so there's this disconnect between what the marketplace is measuring as quality and then what is really happening at the feed level. My point being, that's when there's lots of soybeans around. Nobody's worried about uh, getting the quantities they want. The quality differential between PNW, between US Gulf, and and um, and South American, basically Brazilian soybeans. There is a difference, but it is a small difference compared to not being able to have product. And so the concern was coming into harvest. One of the reasons we're seeing strong um, uh, harvest basis levels for soybean is there was this demand base to get shipments out through the PNW as a backfill or substitute, partial substitute for some of the product going through the US PNW. So what I'm trying to get at is, do you, as, as a global buyer, I would rather have soybeans that may not have the exact quality parameters I want and be able to keep processing and using those than worry about the small differences in, the, in those quality parameters. So it's much more driven by the demand base and the ability to get product shipped to where it needs to be on time. I hope that was clear, probably clear as mud. Brilliant. It was great. Yeah, John, did you have any comments for today? There is one more question. I don't know if this is for Frame. 
It sounds like this looks like a Ron Haugen question. Yeah. Um, it, it remaining 25% of ERP money's coming question mark. Does, can anybody feel that? He's in the office next to me. So I went over there, but he's on another meeting. So I couldn't ask him. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I haven't heard of any news of you frame. I have not. No, I have not. Yeah, so Dave, I, there it is just one piece of news I thought was worth pointing out. I don't have a slide for it, but uh, we found out yesterday in South Dakota in, in, in the community of Sioux Falls that uh, voters actually rejected a campaign to stop a, a, a very large investment, a roughly $500 million investment in a new pork processing plant. And uh, I think this is actually good news in terms of uh, livestock development, not just for those fine people down in in uh, South Dakota, but I also think for uh, pork producers in uh, North Dakota to have access to that market. So uh, just something I think uh, is worth noting and and um, that's really all I have unless there's questions specific to that. That's great. Thanks, John. Yeah, it's quite a quite a lot of activity around that issue the last six months in, in Sioux Falls. Yeah, well, I think I think those folks understand that a five hundred million dollar investment has a substantial direct and indirect economic uh, impacts to that area, and probably uh, outweigh. I mean, there's there's always there's always some negatives with uh, some of those plants, but you know, cost benefit. And I think those people see the the benefit. I don't see any other questions. Does any other presenter have any last comments they want to make? Other than, you know, if you don't have to go out, don't go out. And if you are out, drive safe, right? Yep. Right. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for attending. Thanks to the presenters for, for giving their talks. And we'll see you guys in about a month. Thanks. Mm -hmm.